You've just heard what I think is one of the most significant and moving events in Jesus' ministry. I don't know about you, but if I'm really honest, I sometimes find the Gospels a bit difficult because they're so familiar. And also we sort of focus on when we know Jesus came to die on the cross, what, what was the point of all the bit before? Well, we're going to walk through this story today. We're going to look at it through the eyes of the disciples and through Mary and Martha, and we're going to see what Jesus was saying and communicating and what God was doing in this story. And we're going to find out about what it's like to have Jesus as a friend, what that looks like. We're going to talk about what it's like to follow Jesus when everything feels confused and difficult. And we're going to look at what does this glory of the God look like? The thing that we said as a church, we are founded to see the glory of God in London. What does that look like? So as we go through this passage, these three things I think will stand out. And uh, one of my favourite comments, you've heard me say it before, is we don't just read the Bible. The Bible reads us. It's like a mirror. And as we look into it, we find ourself, our situations. So I would encourage you, as we go through, to think, what is, where am I in this story? We need to know the context, first of all. Jesus is in serious trouble. He's effectively in hiding. He is outside of Judea and Jerusalem. He's even outside of Galilee. He's crossed the river because by now they're hunting for him. By now we're getting close to the point where the authorities are going to want to catch him and put him to death. So he stays away from Jerusalem and Judea. He knows that the cross is close. It's a fact about two to three weeks from this story. He would have been thinking about that already, I'm sure. He would have been starting to think and recognize something of the physical suffering he was going to go through on the cross. But more than that, the emotional uh, suffering the cross was designed to degrade people and make them appear to be less than human. That's how the Romans designed it. And of course, above all of that, he would have been starting to grapple with the sense of abandonment that the cross is. So this is in his mind and his heart and it's just amazing how he can respond to other people while he's starting to think about this, but he does. So the story starts with a message. Your friend Lazarus is ill. We need to understand. Middle Eastern way of saying things is understated. So your friend Lazarus is ill means this is urgent and desperate. This is not just a nice little message updating him on something. This is a desperate cry for help. <laughs> Thank you, Esme. <laughs> Great illustration. So let's, start. so let's start now. Imagine we're the disciples. Let's see what's going on here. So first of all, first of all, the disciples are sad. They've just got this message. Lazarus, Jesus' friend, their friend, is ill. And obviously, it's quite serious. And they're concerned, and they're concerned for Jesus. And then they're confused, because Jesus doesn't respond. They expect him to immediately get going and do something, but he doesn't. But then they're encouraged, because Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. Great news, Lazarus is going to be okay. So we've gone from sad to confused to encouraged and then they relax because Jesus stays there for two days. Well, that, that must mean Lazarus is fine. I mean, they, they stay there, they hang out together, they have meals, they do all the stuff, they see people healed. Oh, this is great, relaxed, no problem. Clearly Lazarus is getting better. And then they're shocked and alarmed because Jesus says, let's go to Judea. The lion's den, the place where they're most dangerous. Why on earth does he want to do that? I mean, the last time he went there, it did not end well. They tried to stone him. So then Jesus goes into two apparently really confusing statements. But actually, I think they're some of his most profound 
teaching. So first of all, when, when they say, <laughs> why are you going to do that? His answer is, to the danger, to the persecution, his answer is simple. A man who walks in the light will not stumble, for he sees by the world's light. It when, it's when he walks by night he stumbles. What on earth does he mean? I mean, clearly they're going to walk in daytime, aren't they? Going down to Jerusalem. They're not going to walk in the night. So we can't be talking about that. Well, John, who wrote this gospel, explains this statement right at the beginning. He obviously got what Jesus was saying. He says, John chapter 1, very familiar verses. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And then later on in his letter, 1 John 1, God is light. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. What Jesus was saying was, if you walk in the light, you're never going to stumble. Whatever the danger ahead of you, whatever the confusion going through your mind, if you walk in the light, you will never stumble. Walking in the light is walking with him, isn't it? Every day, living out of the life he has in us. Dwelling on his word, being filled with his spirit, seeking to be righteous, seeking to deny sin, coming and worshipping on Sunday. This is walking in the light. Whoever walks in the light won't stumble. I don't know if the rest of the disciples got this, but obviously it started to make some sense later on. But just, just as the disciples were trying to work this one out and beginning to understand it, he throws this second cryptic comment out. He says, Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going to wake him up. Well, that sounds like good news. Lazarus isn't going to die. After all, he is only asleep. So what's the problem? What's it all about? And just as they try and work out what this statement means, he just suddenly says, let's go. Let's go. Perhaps not surprisingly, by this stage, they are utterly confused. They really don't know what's going on. And dear Thomas, who seems to be someone who responds emotionally to things, says, OK, let's go and we'll die with him. <laughs> They're confused. <laughs> I think we can let them off a bit. It was a bit melodramatic, but after you've been through this, it's OK, it's not OK, it's OK, I'm confused, it's not OK. I'm not surprised that he says that. But what does this cryptic sidetrack mean about being asleep? I always thought, uh, was Jesus trying to be kind? <laughs> was it almost a slip of the tongue? Why did he say that? Actually, there was a, there's a really important reason why he said it. And in fact, it's not the only time he says it, is it? Because when he goes to see Jairus' daughter, who is dead, he says, don't weep, she's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing she was dead. So this is important. To understand this, we need to back up a bit. We need to go right back to the beginning, right back to the beginning, that first remarkable event in human history, when Adam and Eve, our forebearers, are, are uh, what the Bible talks about them as, as the, the people who set the tone, who set what it is to be humanity, when they first made that calamitous decision to reject God and decide to do things their own way. That was the essence of what we call the fall. It was to say, no, God, I don't trust you for my life. I know you created me and provide everything, but I want to do it my way. And we have made the same decision many times. And the result of that rebellion was to bring condemnation and abandonment and evil into our lives. But also, it, it as it were, rent the, the side of the universe and let in death, sin, and the devil. They were not there before. What, what mankind did was like pulling a gap in the edge of the universe, and in came death, sin, and the devil. And death is a power. It isn't just an event. 
Death is like sin, it is powerful. You can see that in the world because fear of death dominates so much of what people do. It may still dominate your thinking. But death did not exist before the fall. It was just an event. Jesus knew he was about to face death on the cross, but he also knew he was going to defeat it. He knew as a result of what he did on the cross, that rent would have been closed. Death would be defeated. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory, where is your sting? The power of death was broken on the cross with the power of sin and the power of the devil. We no longer need fear death. The world does, understandably, because it isn't just an event, it is a power. But we don't need to fear it. We will still physically pass through it, but it can't hold us. It cannot hold us. Its power over us is broken. It no longer has a sting. So I think that's what Jesus was saying. To bring this truth home, he wanted to understand that as a Christian, we shouldn't talk about death. We should talk about being asleep. Because really, that is a much more accurate picture. Because the world death brings with it all the power of it and so on. And the disciples again got this and passed it on. We see in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, we will not all sleep we will be changed. In 1 Thessalonians 4, those who have fallen asleep. And Peter says, the fathers who went before us are asleep. This is really important to grasp, that death has lost its sting. It's best described as falling asleep for those that are in Jesus. It is just a short interlude between our earthly life and our eternal one with him. There, that's not to say there isn't pain and loss and grief in the process, but it's a beaten enemy. It is toothless. The separation and loss is temporary in the light of eternity. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. That's why he used this strange phrase that resonated in their minds. And they started realizing, okay, death has lost its sting. You read through the Old Testament, death has a sting. To the Jews, it has a sting, it had a power. It's only on the cross that it was broken. Maybe help for a minute. Think of this is, this is a, an off track, but hopefully a helpful one. Think of a caterpillar, okay? Pretty small, probably green or brown. Very insignificant, very boring. All it does is eat. I looked it up and all caterpillars do is eat. And then they die. They go into this cocoon. And actually what happens is all, the, all of the bodily bit of the caterpillar dissolves into a soup. And then something amazing happens. Over a period of only about 10 days, something is created. It's like a rebirth. And what comes out, of course, is a butterfly. Colored, beautiful colors. Able to fly, not just crawl. Radically different from the caterpillar. And yet it's the same insect. It's the same insect. That's a, a miraculous part of creation. And it is a little picture, I think, of what happens to us. It's obviously inadequate. But just as the caterpillar goes through death and what comes out the other side is so much imaginably different and beautiful, and yet it's the same caterpillar. So we, as the Bible says, we perish in dishonor and we're raised in honor. We, we are, first of all, perishable and then imperishable. The change, the new life is amazing. And death is just the process. Jesus often taught like this. He often, rather than formal teaching, he took an event in life and illustrated. They would never have forgotten this. 
This whole episode of Lazarus' death would have been imprinted on their brains and their hearts, and they will have always remembered, oh, just a second, this is only about being asleep, even when there is all the grief and everything else. And I think the most beautiful thing of all is that Jesus will say the same thing about us. My friend, your name, my friend has fallen asleep. I'm going to them to wake them up. <laughs> That's what happens to us when we die. Jesus says, oh, my friend, and I'm not going to name anybody. <laughs> this isn't a good time to name somebody. My friend, <laughs> whoever, has fallen asleep. But I am going to go and wake them. He's going to say that over each of us. So now we arrive in the story at Bethany. We leave the disciples and we meet the two sisters, Mary and Martha. So how do they respond? Well, Martha responds first. I have a lot of sympathy for Martha. She gets quite a bit of grief because of this previous story, uh, particularly, I think, in women's meetings where they contrast Martha and Mary. Martha, the practical, Mary, the one who sits at Jesus' feet. You remember the story? I think she comes out really well in this story, which I think is great. She's the one who responds first. She's the one who notices that Jesus is coming way before Mary, and she goes out to meet him. Her response is clear and direct. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. You might think that's a bit accusatory, but it wasn't for one very simple reason, timing. Lazarus had died four days ago. She would have known when she sent the message to Jesus and when the messengers came back, by that point, Lazarus was dead. So there was no way Jesus could have come, even when he got the message. There was no, no way he could have come. There's nothing accusatory in that comment. I used to read it like that, but it clearly isn't. She's responding in faith. She's simply saying, if you happen to have been here, if you weren't somewhere else, you could have stopped this happening, which is true. So there's a faith response from Martha. And then Jesus tries to draw it out. She says, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. So Jesus says, well, well, well what is that? What is it that you're asking? Are we talking about the resurrection on the last day? Or are we talking about resurrection now? And she struggles with that. She, she sort of ducks it. She sort of, and I think we do the same, believes that God could do anything, but not necessarily for me. Believes that God could do anything, but not necessarily for me. And she sort of backtracks. But then she makes this wonderful declaration that he is the Son of God. It's probably the clearest declaration of who Jesus is in the whole of the Gospels. This is a woman of wonderful faith who is struggling to process what has happened. And she then turns and goes back into the house. Probably it just becomes too much. This combination of grief for the loss of her brother. Jesus has arrived. That is great, but it also just reminds her of the disappointment. So Martha goes back into the house and out comes Mary who has been, I think, probably so much more absorbed in her grief, she hasn't even noticed that Jesus is here. It's Martha who's told her. And she comes and runs towards him, and she kneels at his feet. Her response is one, I suppose, of worship, really. And all she says is the same. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She doesn't demonstrate the same faith as Martha, but she responds in worship different person I think some of us are like Martha we can we can get hold of things to believe and we're processing them where I saying to Jesus help I believe help me in my unbelief some of us are more like Mary the whole thing is overwhelming but I choose to worship I don't know which one you would have been but that was their response and now we get to probably the most intimate glimpse of the heart of Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is the King of Kings, who is the Lord of the universe, 
what he feels about his friends. You see, Mary, Martha and Lazarus, they, they were not important people. They were not disciples. They were not co-workers of Jesus. There was nothing special about them. They were just friends, like you and like me. And this is Jesus' heart for his friends. Not just for leaders or special or experienced. No, for his friends. What does he do? Well, the list is just amazing. It starts off saying he groaned in spirit. That's a level of emotional empathy beyond which even you or I could achieve with our closest friends. It wasn't just a groan, it was a groan in his spirit. He, he took on Mary and Martha's pain and felt it himself. He then says he, he troubled himself. <laughs> he, he deliberately entered into this. He, he could have chosen not to trouble himself, but he felt it. He, it's the same words as in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was facing the cross. He troubled himself. And then those famous shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. It isn't the word for the wailing of the crowds and the professional mourners. It is the word for a stream of tears running down his face. He wept for these friends. And again, as he sees the tomb, he is deeply moved, right in his spirit. Now what of course is most remarkable about all of this is he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He knew that in a matter of moments everyone would be joyful. He knew he was able to turn the whole situation around. He could have walked straight into the situation and said, it's okay, look. I'm going to raise him from the dead. He didn't need to do all this identifying with grief and loss when he knew that was all going to go. But he did. He did. And he does the same with us. He identifies with us. He weeps over us. He feels our feelings at a level that even our closest friends or our parents don't feel. And he chooses to do that even when he knows he's going to turn it around. I think it's one of the most amazing bits of the story. What, what, what sort of a friend is Jesus? Remarkable. But in letting Jesus, letting Lazarus die, he, he did a hard thing. It was an apparently unfeeling, cold, callous response, wasn't it? God can sometimes do hard things in our life for our good. But the story tells us he never does that unfeelingly. He never does that casually. He never does that coldly. There is a beautiful verse in the midst of Lamentations, chapter 3. God does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. I hang on to that verse sometimes. God does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of man. He brings it for a greater purpose, but there's a reluctance while he does it because he feels what we feel. And finally we come to the climax of the story where Jesus simply says, take away the stone. Outrageous, utterly outrageous comment. Lazarus has been dead four days. The body is decayed. The organs have stopped working. The brain is completely brain dead. And it smells. But even on top of that, in Jewish belief, the spirit stayed with the body for three days and then left. So Lazarus is dead dead and more dead. Now Jesus has raised the dead before, hasn't he? Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain's son, but always those have been situations where the person has only just died. And you and I may well have heard of stories of God raising people from the dead through our prayers, and it does happen, and it's amazing. But I've never heard of four days. 
never heard of four days. Because this is a miracle upon miracles. This is more than just a resurrection. This is a whole new life. And this points, of course, to what was going to happen two weeks later when Jesus died on the cross. And it points to your and my resurrection because there is a gap. There's going to be a gap. We don't know how long between the point at which we physically die and the point at which we are resurrected. But we know from Lazarus it doesn't matter how long that is. The resurrection will be complete. It's a foretaste of, Je of our resurrection. Death and decay have been totally defeated. So this is a remarkable miracle. So, he says, roll away the stone. Martha responds in faith. She's the one who has to make the call. She's the old sister, older sister. So she says, let's roll it away. Amazing step of faith. She's come to that. I expect it was the disciples. I can't imagine the mourners were going to roll that stone away. <laughs> I think it was the disciples. I think through their confusion, they've been on this walk, they've been up and down and all over the place, but they're still with Jesus and they're still following him and they're still doing what he asks even when it makes no sense. So there's a real step of faith going on. So the stone is rolled away by men Two and a half weeks later, another stone will be rolled away by angels. You see the way the story resonates? It's an amazing story. But there's one word we missed in the story, which is probably the most significant. It's in verse 6. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so... When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer where he was. So, he loved them, so he stayed. Or another version, he loved them, therefore he stayed. Another version, he loved them, yet he stayed. How can this be love? Even if he didn't know whether he'd get there in time, he could have got there much earlier. How could this be love? Well, it was loving to put Lazarus through death, and the sisters through grief, because it would reveal more of God's glory to them. They saw and touched something of God's glory in those days that they would never forget. Change their lives. Give them the sort of faith we were singing about right at the beginning. You see, we should measure God's love for us, not by how much he answers our prayer and gives us what we need or want, but by how much he reveals himself to us. How much we see of his glory. Because that is what changes us. Our vision as a church is to see the glory of God known in London across the nations. We've got a few nods. Good, a few people can remember. Our vision as a church is to see the glory of God known in London and across the nations. Glory sometimes involves death. We need to have a real picture of what this costs and what this means. It sometimes involves the death of dreams. It sometimes involves the death of relationships. It sometimes involves the death of a career or a provision. But then the glory of God is seen. We want to be committed to see that glory of God because it changes everything. But it sometimes involves death and suffering. But we have a friend in Jesus who is with us in it, who even though he knows he's going to turn it round, feels it as we feel. So, where are you today in the story? Where am I? Are we one of the disciples? Things are a bit confusing at the moment. We don't really know what God is doing. I'm feeling pretty anxious about some stuff. Just like they were. And what did he say to them? If you walk in the light, you won't stumble. And Andrew's phone won't keep going off. <laughs> <laughs> so we could be one of the disciples this morning. That story could have resonated with us. And Jesus says the same thing to us. Maybe... We're a bit like Martha. We believe, but 
we're struggling to believe that God's going to do it for us. Or maybe we've struggled with disappointments. Things haven't happened as we expected. Again, in this story, we find ourselves. She is the one who at the end said, roll away the stone. Step out in faith. Continue to do that and God will meet us. Maybe we're like Mary. We're all caught up emotionally in situations that almost feel overwhelming. I mean, faith doesn't even make any sense. We can worship. We can worship just as they did. So it's a beautiful story. It's an amazing story. It's full of truth about the reality that death has lost its sting and that walking with Jesus is the answer and that he's the greatest friend you or I could ever have. He will even go through stuff that he knows will be changed just so he can identify with us. So can I ask the band to come back? And here we stand. We're going to respond. I don't know what God said to you, so I think I will leave it with you to know how to respond. Maybe, maybe the fear of death still hangs over you. It needn't. Death has lost its sting. It's defeated. And as we sing this, we're going to sing a glorious song, a song we don't sing very often, I think rightly, because it is such an amazing and special song. And in it, if you still find you fear death, then just declare that to Jesus and he will release you from it because death is defeated. I'm going to read a passage in a minute. Maybe you just want to say to him, I, I just want to know you more as a friend today. Or maybe you just want to, given the confusions of how life looks at the moment, <laughs> and say, help me to walk in the light. I just need your light. So there's a different ways we can respond. I'm just going to read the full passage from Corinthians I mentioned, and then we'll, then we'll respond in worship. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable, the caterpillar, inherit the imperishable, the butterfly. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, when the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? We have an amazing future. We have an amazing life now with a friend like Jesus, even with all the challenges of it, but we have a remarkable future. Let's celebrate it.